To tell you an example from India during uh, the pandemic and the difficulties that it posed, you know, to a lot of ordinary people in uh, many parts of the world, you know, including India. One of the experiments that uh, was tried out in the southern state of Kerala was the idea of communal kitchens. Right. Now, that had a big impact on reducing, in fact, the time that women spend uh, cooking because you're socializing that production, right? Instead of each family producing their own food, you're cooking for the whole neighborhood. Moreover, men got involved in a much more way. They won't do it in their home. But when it's done in the communal setting, they get involved in washing dishes, transporting the vessels, etc., etc. You know, so this had a big impact on us. And that is a different way of imagining what life is, what communal life should be. My name is Ajit Sakharias, and I'm affiliated with the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College. Part of the standard of living of workers is provided by the domestic, unpaid domestic services and caring services uh, by, people, by people at home, primarily women, right? And then this was also a focus of debate during the 1970s and 80s with the growth of socialist feminism in the Western world. Right. So the whole question of like uh, domestic labor debate, as it was known. So the literature came, so the part of the LIMTIP is informed by those debates. Uh, part of it is actually got to do with a much more narrower focus, which is to do with like, uh, how do we measure poverty? And this point actually was raised by a pretty mainstream economist, Claire Wickery, in the early 1970s, where she had a critique of the U.S. poverty line. Now, the poverty line is basically supposed to tell you what you need at the minimum to have a, maintain a socially acceptable standard of living. Now, if you were to survive with that amount of income, Vickery argued, you need someone as a full-time caretaker at home. For what? Well, for taking care of the kids, for shopping at the cheapest outlets so that you could live within that limited budget, right? and doing all the other domestic services that are required to reproduce the household as a unit. Right? So this presupposes that the unpaid working time of women at home, or someone else doing this job, right? So the poverty line presupposes that. Now, does everyone have the time to do it or not? A lot of working class families, and she focused on like single female-headed households, working class women who had to raise a family and also earn a living, right? And then you find that, you know, they don't really have the time to do that, to meet these multiple demands on their life. Right? And the conventional poverty measure does not take that into account at all. So this is what we set out to do, um, again, following Vikri's insight, but using modern methods and also bringing into uh, play the intra-household dimension, the division of labor within the household, very much into focus. So our, uh, the work has so far been done for uh, Latin America and for Sub-Saharan Africa and then for South Korea and Turkey. Just to give you a broad overview of what the, what the results look like is that, well, first of all, when you do this adjustment for the conventional poverty line, when you adjust it for the time deficits, the value of the monetized value of the time deficits, right? So we find that poverty is substantially higher. We expect it to be higher because we are going to include in the poverty line some amount of this you know, monetized value of the time deficits, right? But the extent to which that makes a difference is really dramatic. Like for example, in the case of South Korea, it almost doubles the official poverty rate. In Mexico, uh, the last estimates that we did was for like for 2019, and there we find that uh, the increases from the official rate is like, I think, around 40, 45 percent. And when you take this into account, it jumps to like 55, 57 percent. So it's a 10 percentage point increase, which is a huge amount. So it changes then the picture of poverty, the extent, as well as the depth of poverty, which is typically understood as the gap, the unmet income needs of the population. It widens that too. The second crucial finding is that the, when you compare working women and working men, right, and you control for the hours of their employment, that is, you compare women and men who work similar hours, that is, at the job, right, um, you find that women suffer from much higher rate of time poverty than men do from time deficits, right? And the root cause of that is the unequal division 
of domestic labor between men and women. That's one crucial factor. The other factor is the physical infrastructure, which especially in uh, sub-Saharan African countries like Ghana and Ethiopia that we have studied, it's a crucial factor because you have like women or young girls walking several kilometers to fetch water, firewood. You know, a lot of the activities are uh, um, uh, have you know, are negatively affected in you know, terms of lot of time demands because of the poor state of physical infrastructure. But the social infrastructure is also is important. What are the care facilities offered for uh, young kids? Right. This is very important. The so that's one main you know finding about this inequality between men and women. Then the third main aspect, and this is where we have done some work um, using micro simulation techniques to kind of. Uh, do some thought experiments as to, okay, what happens like if women do gain um, access to employment? How does that change the time and income poverty dynamic? Or what are actually the limits of redistribution of domestic labor within the household? And if you think about that, really, when you talk about a lot of working class, poor families, you need both the husband and the wife to work long hours to meet the you know, needs of the family. So how are you going to distribute it equitably, right? Of course, traditional gender norms and you know, things like that play a big role in passing this double burden to the women. But a lot of times within the constraints of working class families, there's a limited amount to which this redistribution can take place within the household. So that's one thing. The other thing is that if you have social infrastructure, physical infrastructure, these things you can improve. But again, there are limits to it. A lot of this got to do with like the way we conceive of uh, domestic work and uh, how we consider rearing of children, raising of children as responsibilities of individual parents rather than in the old African saying, a village, it takes a village to raise a kid. Right? So you got to socialize a lot of these activities. To the extent, and the extent to which they can be socialized will vary across countries and cultures and so on. But some amount of that has to take place. And uh, to tell you an example from India during uh, the pandemic and the difficulties that it posed you know, to a lot of ordinary people in uh, many parts of the world, you know, including India, one of the experiments that uh, was tried out in the southern state of Kerala was the idea of communal kitchens. Right. Now, that had a big impact on reducing, in fact, the time that women spend uh, cooking because you're socializing that production, right? Instead of each family producing their own food, you're cooking for the whole neighborhood. Moreover, men got involved in a much more way. They won't do it in their home. But when it's done in the communal setting, they get involved in washing dishes, transporting the vessels, etc., etc. You know? So this had a big impact on us. And that is a different way of imagining what life is, what communal life should be. Right? So a lot of it requires us to actually think beyond the nuclear family, the individualism of capitalism and what, accept, you know, what forces it to accept as its natural way of living and of way of raising children. And that has to change too, I think. Part of what we are looking at here is uh, the institution of patriarchy. Again, this study is done for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with the collaborative study with myself and uh, colleagues at the Levy Institute as well as colleagues in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we are focusing on Ethiopia, Mali, South Africa, Tanzania, and Ghana. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about this is that um, one factor that influences women's degree of autonomy or their degree of power at the what's described as a meso level, at the community level, has got a lot to do with the strength of patriarchy. Now, by patriarchy, usually what is meant is uh, the, at least in the Western context, is the domination of men over women, right? So, but that is a limited way of thinking about patriarchy when you go to the global south. The reason is that that's only one aspect of the way patriarchy functions in these societies. Another important dimension, the axis along which patriarchy functions is generational domination. So patriarchy should be understood not just as women's uh, subordination to men, but also the domination of the parents or the parent-like figures over the younger folks in the, uh, in the household or in the family. And the, so we construct, I mean, part of the empirical work, this is what I was, going, I was referring to, is uh, we have built indices of patriarchal power um, 
at the meso level at the community level right so what it seeks to capture is this generational domination the male female you know domination as well as what can be described as patrilocality which is what the term that the sociologists and the uh, demographers used to describe how um, young families are tied to the place where their parents live right the patrilocality of that and then there is also the institution of son preference right so this is so this is the four axes along which we are measuring uh, patriarchy the patriarchal structures then there is a whole other domain of uh, patriarchal ideology which has got to do with attitudes right so which uh, again we use uh, data from uh, the world value survey and the afro barometer survey which has been extensively utilized by political scientists and others um, and sociologists to study attitudes so part of the questions there are about like say uh, is it always acceptable for a man to beat his wife or do men always make better political leaders than women so that through those set of surveys and specific questions from those surveys we can capture to a great extent what the degree of prevalence of patriarchal ideology is in the country and then by looking at living arrangements of people information on and that we actually uh, derive from uh, the public use Uh, samples of the censuses that have been conducted in these countries so which also allows us to break the information down at a fine region level you know so so that's how we constructed now just to tell you about some of the interesting things that come up, come out of this is that if you take a place like nonteng province the region in uh, south africa right which is the home uh, of pretoria the administrative capital of the country as well as johannesburg which is like the big commercial you know the center right of the now uh, nonteng ranks pretty high in terms of like the patriarchal you know the degree of power of patriarchy when you compare it across other regions of south africa which is interesting because normally you would think of the lesser developed part and if you look within like you know say if you compare uh, if you take a place like uh, ghana the country like ghana right there the degree of patriarchy will be the least around the great rakra region which is a capital region and the more urbanized part and will be highest in the northern region right so which is the more rural underdeveloped part so so you find this interesting kind of contrast between countries right um, and a lot of this has got to do with the weight of the generational dominance versus the female male dominance right um now the thing is that when we think about this generational dominance or this me male female thing we should not think of them i would argue as uh, mere matters of like power within the family this got a lot to do with the economic policy and especially economic policy regarding retirement regarding child rearing you know child benefits you know things like that because a lot of times what forces or what makes the families the prevalence of the joint families so multi generation families common in the global south is the lack of a proper retirement security that people don't have the ability for most ordinary people with ordinary incomes don't have the ability to live by themselves nor do they have the ability to like you know live in like an old age home or a senior community or anything like that so that in fact makes the you know and they don't have health insurance protections like that so if something happens to you know your grandma or your mother or to parents you're there to take care of them and it works the other way around too because if you have to be both your wife and you're working so they have small children at home then grandma and grandchildren uh, and mean grandpa living with you also provides that right so it's got a lot to do with the economic development and the policies towards employment policy and retirement policy this is actually very integral to the reproduction of patriarchy and patriarchal structures so it's not just a question of like you know people's culture or you know sometimes it's thought about in those terms uh it has got a lot to do with culture i'm not saying that there's no role of culture but a lot of times it's very much tied to economic policies and welfare policies particularly 